Chapter 49 of the D'Artagnan Romances, Volume 1, The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas, translated by William Robson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Fatality Meantime, Milady, drunk with passion, roaring on the deck like a lioness that has been embarked, had been tempted to throw herself into the sea that she might regain the coast, for she could not get rid of the thought that she had been insulted by D'Artagnan, threatened by Athos, and that she had quit France without being revenged on them. This idea soon became so insupportable to her that at the risk of whatever terrible consequences might result to herself from it, she implored the captain to put her on shore. But the captain, eager to escape from his false position, placed between French and English cruisers, like the bat between the mice and the birds, was in great haste to regain England, and positively refused to obey what he took for a woman's caprice, promising his passenger, who had been particularly recommended to him by the cardinal, to land her, if the sea and the French permitted him, at one of the ports of Brittany, either at Lorient or Brest. But the wind was contrary, the sea bad. They tacked and kept off shore. Nine days after leaving the Charente, pale with fatigue and vexation, Milady saw only the blue coasts of Finisterre appear. She calculated that to cross this corner of France and return to the cardinal it would take her at least three days. Add another day for landing, and that would make four. Add these four to the nine others, that would be thirteen days lost. Thirteen days, during which so many important events might pass in London. She reflected likewise that the cardinal would be furious at her return and consequently would be more disposed to listen to the complaints brought against her than to the accusations she brought against others. She allowed the vessel to pass Lorient and Brest, without repeating her request to the captain, who on his part took care not to remind her of it. Milady therefore continued her voyage, and on the very day that Planchet embarked at Portsmouth for France, the messenger of his eminence entered the port in triumph. All the city was agitated by an extraordinary movement, Four large vessels, recently built, had just been launched. At the end of the jetty, his clothes richly laced with gold, glittering, as was customary with him, with diamonds and precious stones, his hat ornamented with a white feather which drooped upon his shoulder, Buckingham was seen surrounded by a staff almost as brilliant as himself. It was one of those rare and beautiful days in winter when England remembers that there is a sun— the star of day, pale but nevertheless still splendid, was setting in the horizon, glorifying at once the heavens and the sea with bands of fire, and casting upon the towers and the old houses of the city a last ray of gold which made the windows sparkle like the reflection of a conflagration. Breathing that sea breeze, so much more invigorating and balsamic as the land is approached, contemplating all the power of those preparations she was commissioned to destroy, all the power of that army which she was to combat alone. She, a woman with a few bags of gold. Milady compared herself mentally to Judith, the terrible Jewess, when she penetrated the camp of the Assyrians and beheld the enormous mass of chariots, horses, men, and arms, which a gesture of her hand was to dissipate like a cloud of smoke. They entered the roadstead, but as they drew near in order to cast anchor, a little cutter, looking like a coast guard formably armed, approached the merchant vessel and dropped into the sea a boat which directed its course to the latter. This boat contained an officer, a mate, and eight rowers. The officer alone went on board, where he was received with all the deference inspired by the uniform. The officer conversed a few instants with the captain, gave him several papers of which he was the bearer to read, and upon the order of the merchant captain the whole crew of the vessel both passengers and sailors, were called upon deck. When this species of summons was made, the officer inquired aloud the point of the brig's departure, its route, its landings, and to all these questions the captain replied without difficulty and without hesitation. Then the officer began to pass and review all the people, one after the other, and stopping when he came to Milady, surveyed her very closely, but without addressing a single word to her. He then returned to the captain, said a few words to him, and as if from that moment the vessel was under his command, he ordered a maneuver which the crew executed immediately. 
Then the vessel resumed its course, still escorted by the little cutter, which sailed side by side with it, menacing it with the mouths of its six cannon. The boat followed in the wake of the ship, a speck near the enormous mass. During the examination of Milady by the officer, as may well be imagined, Milady on her part was not less scrutinizing in her glances. But however great was the power of this woman, with eyes of flame and reading the hearts of those whose secrets she wished to divine, she met this time with a countenance of such impassivity that no discovery followed her investigation. The officer who had stopped in front of her and studied her with so much care might have been twenty-five or twenty-six years of age. He was of pale complexion with clear blue eyes, rather deeply set. His mouth, fine and well cut, remained motionless in its correct lines. His chin, strongly marked, denoted the strength of will, which in the ordinary Britannic type denotes mostly nothing but obstinacy. A brow a little receding, as is proper for poets, enthusiasts, and soldiers, was scarcely shaded by short, thin hair, which, like the beard which covered the lower part of his face, was of a beautiful deep chestnut color. When they entered the port, it was already night. The fog increased the darkness, and formed round the stern lights and lanterns of the jetty a circle like that which surrounds the moon when the weather threatens to become rainy. The air they breathed was heavy, damp, and cold. Milady, that woman so courageous and firm, shivered in spite of herself. The officer desired to have Milady's packages pointed out to him, and ordered them to be placed in the boat. When this operation was complete, he invited her to descend by offering her his hand. Milady looked at this man and hesitated. "'Who are you, sir?' asked she. "'Who has the kindness to trouble yourself so particularly on my account?' "'You may perceive, madame, by my uniform, that I am an officer in the English navy,' replied the young man. "'But is it the custom for the officers in the English navy to place themselves at the service of their female compatriots when they land in a port of Great Britain?' and carry their gallantry so far as to conduct them ashore. Yes, madame, it is the custom, not from gallantry, but prudence, that in time of war foreigners should be conducted to particular hotels, in order that they may remain under the eye of the government until full information can be obtained about them. These words were pronounced with the most exact politeness and the most perfect calmness. Nevertheless, they had not the power of convincing Milady. "'But I am not a foreigner, sir,' said she, with an accent as pure as ever was heard between Portsmouth and Manchester. "'My name is Lady Clarick, and this measure—' "'This measure is general, madame, and you will seek in vain to evade it.' "'I will follow you then, sir.' Accepting the hand of the officer, she began the descent of the ladder, at the foot of which the boat waited. The officer followed her. A large cloak was spread at the stern. The officer requested her to sit down upon this cloak and place himself beside her. "'Row!' said he to the sailors. The eight oars fell at once into the sea, making but a single sound, giving but a single stroke, and the boat seemed to fly over the surface of the water. In five minutes they gained the land. The officer leaped to the pier and offered his hand to Milady. A carriage was in waiting." "'Is this carriage for us?' asked Milady. "'Yes, madame,' replied the officer. "'The hotel, then, is far away?' "'At the other end of the town.' "'Very well,' said Milady, and she resolutely entered the carriage. The officer saw that the baggage was fastened carefully behind the carriage, and this operation ended, he took his place beside Milady and shut the door. Immediately, without any order being given or his place of destination indicated, the coachman set off at a rapid pace and plunged into the streets of the city. So strange a reception naturally gave Milady ample matter for reflection. So seeing that the young officer did not seem at all disposed for conversation, she reclined in her corner of the carriage, and one after the other passed in review all the surmises which presented themselves to her mind. At the end of a quarter of an hour, however, Surprised at the length of the journey, she leaned forward toward the door to see whither she was being conducted. Houses were no longer to be seen. Trees appeared in the darkness like great black phantoms chasing one another. 
Milady shuddered. "'But we are no longer in the city, sir,' said she. The young officer preserved silence. "'I beg you to understand, sir. I will go no farther unless you tell me whither you are taking me.' This threat brought no reply. "'Oh, this is too much!' cried Milady. "'Help! Help!' No voice replied to hers. The carriage continued to roll on with rapidity. The officer seemed a statue. Milady looked at the officer with one of those terrible expressions peculiar to her countenance, and which so rarely failed of their effect. Anger made her eyes flash in the darkness. The young man remained immovable. Milady tried to open the door in order to throw herself out. "'Take care, madame,' said the young man coolly. "'You will kill yourself in jumping.' Milady reseated herself, foaming. The officer leaned forward, looked at her in his turn, and appeared surprised to see that face, just before so beautiful, distorted with passion and almost hideous. The artful creature at once comprehended that she was injuring herself by allowing him thus to read her soul. She collected her features, and in a complaining voice said, "'In the name of heaven, sir, tell me if it is to you, if it is to your government.' If it is to an enemy, I am to attribute the violence that is done to me. No violence will be offered to you, madame, and what happens to you is the result of a very simple measure, which we are obliged to adopt with all who land in England. Then you don't know me, sir. It is the first time I have had the honor of seeing you. And on your honor, you have no cause of hatred against me? None, I swear to you. There was so much serenity, coolness, mildness even in the voice of the young man that Milady felt reassured. At length, after a journey of nearly an hour, the carriage stopped before an iron gate, which closed an avenue leading to a castle severe in form, massive and isolated. Then, as the wheels rolled over a fine gravel, Milady could hear a vast roaring, which she at once recognized as the voice of the sea dashing against some steep cliffs. The carriage passed under two arched gateways, and at length stopped in a court, large, dark, and square. Almost immediately the door of the carriage was opened, the young man sprang lightly out, and presented his hand to Milady, who leaned upon it, and in her turn alighted with tolerable calmness. "'Still, then, I am a prisoner,' said Milady, looking around her and bringing back her eyes with a most gracious smile to the young officer." "'But I feel assured it will not be for long,' added she. "'My own conscience and your politeness, sir, are the guarantees of that.' However flattering this compliment, the officer made no reply, but drawing from his belt a little silver whistle such as boatswains use in ships of war, he whistled three times with three different modulations. Immediately several men appeared who unharnessed the smoking horses and put the carriage into a house. Then the officer, with the same calm politeness, invited his prisoner to enter the house. She, with a still smiling countenance, took his arm and passed with him under a low, arched door, which by a vaulted passage, lighted only at the farther end, led to a stone staircase around an angle of stone. They then came to a massive door, which after the introduction into the lock of a key which the young man carried with him, turned heavily upon its hinges and disclosed the chamber destined for Milady. With a single glance, the prisoner took in the apartment in its minutest details. It was a chamber whose furniture was at once appropriate for a prisoner or a free man, and yet bars at the windows and outside bolts at the door decided the question in favor of the prison. In an instant, all the strength of mind of this creature, though drawn from the most vigorous sources, abandoned her. She sank into a large easy-chair with her arms crossed, her head lowered, and expecting every instant to see a judge enter to interrogate her. But no one entered except two or three marines, who brought her trunks and packages, deposited them in a corner, and retired without speaking. The officer superintended all these details with the same calmness Milady had constantly seen in him, never pronouncing a word himself, and making himself obeyed by a gesture of his hand or a sound of his whistle. It might have been said that between this man and his inferiors, spoken language did not exist, or had become useless. 
At length, Milady could hold out no longer. She broke the silence. "'In the name of heaven, sir,' cried she, "'what means all that is passing? Put an end to my doubts. I have courage enough for any danger I can foresee, for every misfortune which I understand. Where am I, and why am I here? If I am free, why these bars and these doors? If I am a prisoner, what crime have I committed?' "'You are here in the apartment destined for you, madame. "'I received orders to go and take charge of you on the sea "'and to conduct you to this castle. "'This order, I believe, I have accomplished "'with all the exactness of a soldier, "'but also with the courtesy of a gentleman. "'There terminates, at least to the present moment, "'the duty I had to fulfill toward you. "'The rest concerns another person.' "'And who is that other person?' asked Milady warmly. "'Can you not tell me his name?' At the moment a great jingling of spurs was heard on the stairs. Some voices passed and faded away, and the sound of a single footstep approached the door. "'That person is here, madame,' said the officer, leaving the entrance open and drawing himself up in an attitude of respect. At the same time the door opened. A man appeared on the threshold. He was without a hat— carried a sword, and flourished a handkerchief in his hand. Milady thought she recognized this shadow in the gloom. She supported herself with one hand upon the arm of the chair, and advanced her head as if to meet a certainty. The stranger advanced slowly, and as he advanced, after entering into the circle of light projected by the lamp, Milady involuntarily drew back. Then, when she had no longer any doubt, she cried in a state of stupor, what my brother is it you yes fair lady replied lord de winter making a bow half courteous half ironical it is i myself but this castle then is mine this chamber is yours i am then your prisoner nearly so but this is a frightful abuse of power. No high-sounding words. Let us sit down and chat quietly, as a brother and sister ought to do. Then, turning toward the door and seeing that the young officer was waiting for his last orders, he said, All is well. I thank you. Now leave us alone, Mr. Felton. End of chapter 49 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia Chapter Fifty of the D'Artagnan Romances, Volume One: The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas, translated by William Robson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chat between brother and sister. During the time which Lord de Winter took to shut the door, close a shutter, and draw a chair near to his sister-in-law's fauteuil, Milady, anxiously thoughtful, plunged her glance into the depths of possibility and discovered all the plan of which she could not even obtain a glance as long as she was ignorant into whose hands she had fallen. She knew her brother-in-law to be a worthy gentleman, a bold hunter, an intrepid player, enterprising with women, but by no means remarkable for his skill and intrigues. How had he discovered her arrival and caused her to be seized? Why did he detain her? Athos had dropped some words which proved that the conversation she had with the cardinal had fallen into outside ears, but she could not suppose that he had dug a countermine so promptly and so boldly. She rather feared that her preceding operations in England might have been discovered. Buckingham might have guessed that it was she who had cut off the two studs, and avenged himself for that little treachery, but Buckingham was incapable of going to any excess against a woman particularly if that woman was supposed to have acted from a feeling of jealousy. This supposition appeared to her most reasonable. It seemed to her that they wanted to revenge the past and not to anticipate the future. At all events, she congratulated herself upon having fallen into the hands of her brother-in-law, with whom she reckoned she could deal very easily, rather than into the hands of an acknowledged and intelligent enemy. "'Yes, let us chat, brother.' said she with a kind of cheerfulness, decided as she was to draw from the conversation, in spite of all the dissimulation Lord de Winter could bring, 
the revelations of which she stood in need to regulate her future conduct. "'You have, then, decided to come to England again?' said Lord de Winter, in spite of the resolutions you so often expressed in Paris, never to set your feet on British ground. Milady replied to this question by another question. "'To begin with, tell me,' said she, "'how have you watched me so closely as to be aware beforehand not only of my arrival, but even of the day, the hour, and the port at which I should arrive?' Lord de Winter adopted the same tactics as Milady, thinking that as his sister-in-law employed them, they must be the best. "'But tell me, my dear sister,' replied he, "'what makes you come to England?' "'I come to see you,' replied Milady, without knowing how much he aggravated by this reply the suspicions to which D'Artagnan's letter had given birth in the mind of her brother-in-law, and only desiring to gain the good will of her auditor by a falsehood. "'Ah!' "'To see me,' said de Winter, cunningly. "'To be sure to see you. What is there astonishing in that?' "'And you had no other object in coming to England but to see me?' "'No.' "'So it was for me alone you have taken the trouble to cross the channel?' "'For you alone.' "'The deuce! What tenderness, my sister!' "'But am I not your nearest relative?' demanded Milady with a tone of the most touching ingenuousness. "'And my only heir, are you not?' said Lord de Winter in his turn, fixing his eyes on those of Milady. Whatever command she had over herself, Milady could not help starting, and as in pronouncing the last words Lord de Winter placed his hand upon the arm of his sister, this start did not escape him. In fact, the blow was direct and severe. The first idea that occurred to Milady's mind was that she had been betrayed by Kitty, and that she had recounted to the Baron the selfish aversion toward himself of which she had imprudently allowed some marks to escape before her servant. She also recollected the furious and imprudent attack she had made upon D'Artagnan when he spared the life of her brother. "'I do not understand, my lord.' said she in order to gain time and make her adversary speak out. "'What do you mean to say? Is there any secret meaning concealed beneath your words?' "'Oh, my God, no!' said Lord de Winter with apparent good nature. "'You wish to see me, and you come to England. I learn this desire, or rather I suspect that you feel it, and in order to spare you all the annoyances of a nocturnal arrival in a port and all the fatigues of landing, I send one of my officers to meet you. I place a carriage at his orders, and he brings you hither to this castle, of which I am governor, whither I come every day and where, in order to satisfy our mutual desire of seeing each other, I have prepared you a chamber." What is there more astonishing in all that I have said to you than in what you have told me? No, what I think astonishing is that you should expect my coming. And yet that is the most simple thing in the world, my dear sister. Have you not observed that the captain of your little vessel, on entering the roadstead, sent forward, in order to obtain permission to enter the port, a little boat bearing his log-book in the register of his voyages. I am commandant of the port. They brought me that book. I recognized your name in it. My heart told me that what your mouth has just confirmed, that is to say, with what view you have exposed yourself to the dangers of a sea so perilous, or at least so troublesome at this moment, and I sent my cutter to meet you. You know the rest." Milady knew that Lord de Winter lied, and she was the more alarmed. "'My brother,' continued she, "'was not that my Lord Buckingham whom I saw on the jetty this evening as we arrived?' "'Himself! Ah! I can understand how the sight of him struck you,' replied Lord de Winter. "'You came from a country where he must be very much talked of, and I know that his armaments against France greatly engage the attention of your friend, the Cardinal. My friend, the Cardinal? 
cried Milady, seeing that on this point, as on the other, Lord de Winter seemed well instructed. "'Is he not your friend?' replied the baron negligently. "'Ah, pardon, I thought so, but we will return to my lord duke presently. Let us not depart from the sentimental turn our conversation has taken. You came, you say, to see me?' "'Yes.' "'Well, I reply that you shall be served to the height of your wishes, and that we shall see each other every day.' "'Am I, then, to remain here eternally?' demanded Milady with a certain terror. Uh, "'Do you find yourself badly lodged, sister? Demand anything you want, and I will hasten to have you furnished with it.' "'But I have neither my women nor my servants.' "'You shall have all, madame. Tell me on what footing your household was established by your first husband, and although I am only your brother-in-law, I will arrange one similar.' "'My first husband?' cried Milady, looking at Lord de Winter with eyes almost starting from their sockets. "'Yes, your French husband. I don't speak of my brother. If you are forgotten, as he is still living, I can write to him, and he will send me information on the subject.' A cold sweat burst from the brow of Milady. "'You jest,' said she in a hollow voice. "'Do I look so?' said the baron, rising and going a step backward. "'Or, oh, rather, you insult me,' continued she, pressing with her stiffened hands the two arms of her easy chair and raising herself upon her wrists. "'I insult you,' said Lord de Winter with contempt. "'In truth, madame, do you think that can be possible?' "'Indeed, sir,' said Milady. You must be either drunk or mad. Leave the room, and send me a woman. Women are very indiscreet, my sister. Cannot I serve you as a waiting-maid? By that means all our secrets will remain in the family. Insolent! cried Milady, and as if acted upon by a spring, she bounded toward the baron, who awaited her attack with his crossed arms, but nevertheless with one hand on the hilt of his sword come said he i know you are accustomed to assassinate people but i warn you i shall defend myself even against you you are right said milady you have all the appearance of being cowardly enough to lift your hand against a woman perhaps so and i have an excuse for mine would not be the first hand of a man that has been placed upon you, I imagine. And the baron pointed with a slow and accusing gesture to the left shoulder of Milady, which he almost touched with his finger. Milady uttered a deep, inward shriek, and retreated to a corner of the room like a panther which crouches for a spring. "'Oh, growl as much as you please,' cried Lord de Winter. But don't try to bite, for I warn you that it would be to your disadvantage. There are here no procurators who regulate successions beforehand. There is no knight errant to come and seek a quarrel with me on account of the fair lady I detain a prisoner. But I have judges quite ready who will quickly dispose of a woman so shameless as to glide, a bigamist, into the bed of Lord de Winter, my brother and these judges, I warn you, will soon send you to an executioner who will make both your shoulders alike. The eyes of Milady darted such flashes that although he was a man and armed before an unarmed woman, he felt the chill of fear glide through his whole frame. However, he continued all the same but with increasing warmth. Yes, I can very well understand that after having inherited the fortune of my brother, it would be very agreeable to you to be my heir likewise, but know beforehand, if you kill me or cause me to be killed, my precautions are taken. Not a penny of what I possess will pass into your hands. Were you not already rich enough, you who possess nearly a million? And could you not stop your fatal career if you did not do evil for the infinite and supreme joy of doing it, 
Oh, be assured, if the memory of my brother were not sacred to me, you should rot in a state dungeon or satisfy the curiosity of sailors at Tyburn. I will be silent, but you must endure your captivity quietly. In fifteen or twenty days I shall set out for La Rochelle with the army, but on the eve of my departure a vessel which I shall see depart will take you hence and convey you to our colonies in the south, and be assured that you shall be accompanied by one who will blow your brains out at the first attempt you make to return to England or the continent. Milady listened with an attention that dilated her inflamed eyes. Yes, at present, continued Lord de Winter, you will remain in this castle. The walls are thick, the doors strong, and the bars solid. Besides, your window opens immediately over the sea. The men of my crew, who are devoted to me for life and death, mount guard around this apartment, and watch all the passages that lead to the courtyard. Even if you gained the yard, there would still be three iron gates for you to pass. The order is positive. A step, a gesture, a word on your part, denoting an effort to escape, and you are to be fired upon. If they kill you, English justice will be under an obligation to me for having saved it trouble. Ah, I see your features regain their calmness. Your countenance recovers its assurance. You are saying to yourself, fifteen days, twenty days, bah! I have an inventive mind. Before that is expired, some idea will occur to me. I have an infernal spirit. I shall meet with a victim. Before fifteen days are gone, by I shall be away from here. Ah, try it. Milady, finding her thoughts betrayed, dug her nails into her flesh to subdue every emotion that might give to her face any expression except agony. Lord de Winter continued. The officer who commands here in my absence, you have already seen and therefore know him. He knows how, as you must have observed, to obey an order, for you did it not, I am sure, come from the Portsmouth hither without endeavoring to make him speak. What do you say of him? Could a statue of marble have been more impassive and more mute? You have already tried the power of your seductions upon many men, and unfortunately you have always succeeded. But I give you leave to try them upon this one. Pardieu, if you succeed with him, I pronounce you the demon himself. He went toward the door and opened it hastily. Call Mr. Felton, said he. Wait a minute longer, and I will introduce him to you. There followed between these two personages a strange silence, during which the sound of a slow and regular step was heard approaching. Shortly, a human form appeared in the shade of the corridor, and the young lieutenant, with whom we are already acquainted, stopped at the threshold to receive the orders of the baron. "'Come in, my dear John,' said Lord de Winter. "'Come in and shut the door.' The young officer entered. "'Now,' said the baron, "'look at this woman. She is young, she is beautiful, she possesses all earthly seductions. Well,' She is a monster, who at twenty-five years of age has been guilty of as many crimes as you could read in a year in the archives of our tribunals. Her voice prejudices her hearers in her favor. Her beauty serves as a bait to her victims. Her body even pays what she promises. I must do her that justice. She will try to seduce you. Perhaps she will try to kill you. I have extricated you from misery, Felton. I have caused you to be named lieutenant. I once saved your life. You know on what occasion. I am for you not only a protector, but a friend, not only a benefactor, but a father. This woman has come back again into England for the purpose of conspiring against my life. I hold this serpent in my hands. Well, I call you, and I say to you, friend Felton, john my child guard me and more particularly guard yourself against this woman swear by your hopes of salvation to keep her safely for the chastisement she has merited john felton i trust your word john felton i put faith in your loyalty 
my lord said the young officer summoning to his mild countenance all the hatred he could find in his heart my lord i swear all shall be done as you desire milady received this look like a resigned victim it was impossible to imagine a more submissive or a more mild expression than that which prevailed on her beautiful countenance lord de winter himself could scarcely recognize the tigress who a minute before prepared apparently for a fight she is not to leave this chamber understand john continued the baron she is to correspond with nobody she is to speak to no one but you if you will do her the honor to address a word to her that is sufficient my lord i have sworn and now madame try to make your peace with god for you are judged by men milady let her head sink as if crushed by this sentence lord de winter went out making a sign to felton who followed him shutting the door after him one instant after the heavy step of a marine who served as sentinel was heard in the corridor his axe in his girdle and his musket on his shoulder milady remained for some minutes in the same position for she thought they might perhaps be examining her through the keyhole she then slowly raised her head which had resumed its formidable expression of menace and defiance ran to the door to listen looked out of her window and returning to bury herself again in her large armchair she reflected end of chapter fifty recording by john van stan savannah georgia Chapter fifty one of the D'Artagnan Romances, Volume One, The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas, translated by William Robson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Officer. Meanwhile, the cardinal looked anxiously for news from England, but no news arrived that was not annoying and threatening. Although La Rochelle was invested, however certain success might appear, thanks to the precautions taken and above all to the dike which prevented the entrance of any vessel into the besieged city the blockade might last a long time yet this was a great affront to the king's army and a great inconvenience to the cardinal who had no longer it is true to embroil louis the thirteenth with anne of austria for that affair was over but he had to adjust matters for monsieur de bassompierre who was embroiled with the duc d'angouleme as to monsieur who had begun the siege he left to the cardinal the task of finishing it the city notwithstanding the incredible perseverance of its mayor had attempted a sort of mutiny for a surrender the mayor had hanged the mutineers this execution quieted the ill-disposed who resolved to allow themselves to die of hunger this death always appearing to them more slow and less sure than strangulation on their side from time to time the besiegers took the messengers which the rochelais sent to buckingham or the spies which buckingham sent to the rochelais in one case or the other the trial was soon over the cardinal pronounced the single word hanged the king was invited to come and see the hanging he came languidly placing himself in a good situation to see all the details this amused him sometimes a little and made him endure the siege with patience but it did not prevent his getting very tired or from talking at every moment of returning to paris so that if the messengers and the spies had failed his eminence notwithstanding all his inventiveness would have found himself much embarrassed nevertheless time passed on and the rochelais did not surrender the last spy that was taken was the bearer of a letter this letter told buckingham that the city was at an extremity but instead of adding if your succor does not arrive within fifteen days we will surrender it added quite simply if your succor does not come within fifteen days we shall all be dead with hunger when it comes the rochelais then had no hope but in buckingham buckingham was their messiah it was evident that if they one day learned positively that they must not count on buckingham their courage would fail with their hope the cardinal looked then with great impatience for the news from england which would announce to him that buckingham would not come the question of carrying the city by assault though often debated in the council of the king had been always rejected in the first place la rochelle appeared impregnable then the cardinal whatever he said very well knew that the horror of bloodshed in this encounter in which frenchmen would combat against frenchmen 
was a retrograde movement of sixty years impressed upon his policy, and the cardinal was at that period what we now call a man of progress. In fact, the sack of La Rochelle and the assassination of three or four thousand Huguenots who allowed themselves to be killed would resemble too closely in 1628 the massacre of St. Bartholomew in 1572, and then, above all this, this extreme measure which was not at all repugnant to the king, good Catholic as he was, always fell before this argument of the besieging generals. La Rochelle is impregnable except to famine. The cardinal could not drive from his mind the fear he entertained of his terrible emissary, for he comprehended the strange qualities of this woman, sometimes a serpent, sometimes a lion. Had she betrayed him? Was she dead? He knew her well enough in all cases to know that whether acting for or against him, as a friend or an enemy, she would not remain motionless without great impediments. But whence did these impediments arise? That was what he could not know. And yet he reckoned, and with reason, on Milady. He had divined in the past of this woman terrible things which his red mantle alone could cover, and he felt, from one call to another, that this woman was his own, as she could look to no other but himself for a support superior to the danger which threatened her. He resolved then to carry on the war alone, and to look for no success foreign to himself, but as we look for a fortunate chance. He continued to press the raising of the famous dyke which was to starve La Rochelle. Meanwhile he cast his eyes over the unfortunate city which contained so much deep misery and so many heroic virtues, and recalling the saying of Louis XI, his political predecessor, as he himself was the predecessor of Robespierre, he repeated this maxim of Tristan's gossip, divide in order to reign. Henry the Fourth, when besieging Paris, had loaves and provisions thrown over the walls. The cardinal had little notes thrown over in which he represented to the Rochelais how unjust, selfish, and barbarous was the conduct of their leaders. These leaders had corn in abundance, and would not let them partake of it. They adopted as a maxim, for they too had maxims, that it was of very little consequence that women, children, and old men should die, so long as the men who were to defend the walls remained strong and healthy. Up to that time, whether from devotedness or from want of power to act against it, this maxim, without being generally adopted, nevertheless passed from theory into practice. But the notes did it injury. The notes reminded the men that the children, women, and old men whom they allowed to die were their sons, their wives, and their fathers, and that it would be more just for every one to be reduced to the common misery, in order that equal conditions should give birth to unanimous resolutions. These notes had all the effect that he who wrote them could expect, in that they induced a great number of the inhabitants to open private negotiations with the royal army. But at the moment when the cardinal saw his means already bearing fruit, and applauded himself for having put it in action, an inhabitant of La Rochelle who had contrived to pass the royal lines, God knows how, such was the watchfulness of Bassompierre, Schomberg, and the Duc d'Angoulême, themselves watched over by the cardinal, an inhabitant of La Rochelle, we say, entered the city, coming from Portsmouth, and saying that he had seen a magnificent fleet ready to sail within eight days. Still further, Buckingham announced to the mayor that at length the Great League was about to declare itself against France, and that the kingdom would be at once invaded by the English, Imperial, and Spanish armies. This letter was read publicly in all parts of the city. Copies were put up at the corners of the streets, and even they who had begun to open negotiations interrupted them, being resolved to await the succor so pompously announced. This unexpected circumstance brought back Richelieu's former anxiety, and forced him, in spite of himself, once more to turn his eyes to the other side of the sea. During this time, exempt from the anxiety of its only and true chief, the royal army led a joyous life, neither provisions nor money being wanting in the camp. All the corps rivaled one another in audacity and gaiety, to take spies and hang them, to make hazardous expeditions upon the dike or the sea, to imagine wild plans, and to execute them coolly, 
Such were the pastimes which made the army find these days short, which were not only so long to the Rochelais, a prey to famine and anxiety, but even to the cardinal who blockaded them so closely. Sometimes, when the cardinal, always on horseback, like the lowest gendarme of the army, cast a pensive glance over those works, so slowly keeping pace with his wishes, which the engineers brought from all the corners of France were executing under his orders, if he met a musketeer of the company of Treville, he drew near and looked at him in a peculiar manner, and not recognizing in him one of our four companions, he turned his penetrating look and profound thoughts in another direction. One day, when oppressed with a mortal weariness of mind, without hope in the negotiations with the city, without news from England, the cardinal went out, without any other aim than to be out of doors, and accompanied only by Cahusac and La Houtinière, strolled along the beach. Mingling the immensity of his dreams with the immensity of the ocean, he came, his horse going at a foot's pace, to a hill from the top of which he perceived behind a hedge, reclining on the sand and catching in its passage one of those rays of the sun so rare at this period of the year, seven men surrounded by empty bottles. Four of these men were our musketeers, preparing to listen to a letter one of them had just received. This letter was so important that it made them forsake their cards and their dice on the drumhead. The other three were occupied in opening an enormous flagon of colicure wine. These were the lackeys of these gentlemen. The cardinal was, as we have said, in very low spirits, and nothing when he was in that state of mind increased his depression so much as gaiety in others. Besides, he had another strange fancy which was always to believe that the causes of his sadness created the gaiety of others. Making a sign to La Houtinière and Cahusac to stop, he alighted from his horse and went toward these suspected merry companions, hoping by means of the sand which deadened the sound of his steps and of the hedge which concealed his approach to catch some words of this conversation which appeared so interesting. At ten paces from the hedge he recognized the talkative Gascon, and as he had already perceived that these men were musketeers, he did not doubt that the three others were those called the inseparables, that is to say, Athos, Porthos, and Aramis. It may be supposed that his desire to hear the conversation was augmented by this discovery. His eyes took a strange expression, and with a step of a tiger-cat he advanced toward the hedge but he had not been able to catch more than a few vague syllables without any positive sense when a sonorous and short cry made him start and attracted the attention of the musketeers. "'Officer!' cried Grimaud. "'You are speaking, you scoundrel,' said Athos, rising upon his elbow and transfixing Grimaud with his flaming look. Grimaud therefore added nothing to his speech, but contented himself with pointing his index finger in the direction of the hedge, announcing by this gesture the cardinal and his escort. With a single bound, the musketeers were on their feet and saluted with respect. The cardinal seemed furious. "'It appears that messieurs the musketeers keep guard,' said he. "'Are the English expected by land, or do the musketeers consider themselves superior officers?' "'Monseigneur,' replied Athos, for amid the general fright he alone had preserved the noble calmness and coolness that never forsook him. Monseigneur, the musketeers, when they are not on duty, or when their duty is over, drink and play at dice, and they are certainly superior officers to their lackeys. Lackeys, grumbled the cardinal, lackeys, who have the order to warn their masters when anyone passes, are not lackeys, they are sentinels. Your eminence may perceive that if we had not taken this precaution, we should have been exposed to allowing you to pass without presenting you our respects or offering you our thanks for the favor you have done us in uniting us. D'Artagnan, continued Athos, you, who but lately were so anxious for such an opportunity for expressing your gratitude to Monseigneur, here it is. Avail yourself of it. These words were pronounced with that imperturbable phlegm which distinguished Athos in the hour of danger. 
and with that excessive politeness which made of him at certain moments a king more majestic than kings by birth. D'Artagnan came forward and stammered out a few words of gratitude, which soon expired under the gloomy looks of the cardinal. "'It does not signify, gentlemen,' continued the cardinal, without appearing to be in the least swerved from his first intention by the diversion which Athos had started. "'It does not signify, gentlemen. I do not like to have simple soldiers, because they have the advantage of serving in the privileged corps, thus to play the great lords.' Discipline is the same for them as for everybody else. Athos allowed the cardinal to finish his sentence completely and bowed in sign of assent. Then he resumed in his turn. Discipline, Monseigneur, has, I hope, in no way been forgotten by us. We are not on duty, and we believe that not being on duty, we were at liberty to dispose of our time as we pleased. If we are so fortunate, as to have some particular duty to perform for your eminence, we are ready to obey you. Your eminence may perceive, continued Athos, knitting his brow, for this sort of investigation began to annoy him, that we have not come out without our arms. And he showed the cardinal with his finger the four muskets piled near the drum, on which were the cards and dice. Your eminence may believe, added d'artagnan that we would have come to meet you if we could have supposed it was monseigneur coming toward us with so few attendants the cardinal bit his mustache and even his lips a little do you know what you look like altogether as you are armed and guarded by your lackeys said the cardinal you look like four conspirators oh as to that monseigneur it is true said athos we do conspire as your eminence might have seen the other morning only we conspire against the rochelais ah you gentlemen of policy replied the cardinal knitting his brow in his turn the secret of many unknown things may perhaps be found in your brains if we could read them as you read that letter which you concealed as soon as you saw me coming. The color mounted to the face of Athos, and he made a step toward his eminence. One might think you really suspected us, Monseigneur, and we were undergoing a real interrogatory. If it be so, we trust your eminence will deign to explain yourself, and we should then at least be acquainted with our real position." "'And if it were an interrogatory?' replied the cardinal. "'Others besides you have undergone such, Monsieur Athos, and have replied thereto.' "'Thus I have told your eminence that you had but to question us, and we are ready to reply.' "'What was that letter you were about to read, Monsieur Aramis, and which you so promptly concealed?' "'A woman's letter, Monseigneur.' "'Ah, yes, I see,' said the cardinal. "'We must be discreet with this sort of letters. "'But nevertheless, we may show them to a confessor, "'and you know I have taken orders.' "'Monseigneur,' said Athos, with a calmness the more terrible "'because he risked his head in making this reply, "'the letter is a woman's letter, "'but it is neither signed Marianne de Lorme nor Madame d'Aguillon.' The cardinal became as pale as death. Lightning darted from his eyes. He turned round as if to give an order to Cahusac and Houdinier. Athos saw the movement. He made a step toward the muskets, upon which the other three friends had fixed their eyes, like men ill-disposed to allow themselves to be taken. The cardinalists were three, the musketeers, lackeys included, were seven. He judged that the match would be so much the less equal if Athos and his companions were really plotting, and by one of those rapid turns which he always had at command, all his anger faded away into a smile. "'Well, well,' said he, "'you are brave young men, proud in daylight, faithful in darkness. We can find no fault with you for watching over yourselves when you watch so carefully over others. Gentlemen, 
I have not forgotten the night in which you served me as an escort to the Red Dovecot. If there were any danger to be apprehended on the road I am going, I would request you to accompany me. But as there is none, remain where you are. Finish your bottles, your game, and your letter. Adieu, gentlemen. And remounting his horse, which Cahusac led to him, he saluted them with his hand and rode away. The four young men, standing and motionless, followed him with their eyes without speaking a single word until he had disappeared. They then looked at one another. The countenances of all gave evidence of terror, for notwithstanding the friendly adieu of his eminence, they plainly perceived that the cardinal went away with rage in his heart. Athos alone smiled with a self-possessed, disdainful smile. When the cardinal was out of hearing and sight, "'That Grimaud kept bad watch,' cried Porthos, who had a great inclination to vent his ill-humor on somebody. Grimaud was about to reply to excuse himself. Athos lifted his finger, and Grimaud was silent. "'Would you have given up the letter, Aramis?' said D'Artagnan. "'I,' said Aramis in his most flute-like tone, "'I had made up my mind.' If he had insisted upon the letter being given up to him, I would have presented the letter to him with one hand, and with the other I would have run my sword through his body. I expected as much, said Athos, and that was why I threw myself between you and him. Indeed, this man is very much to blame for talking thus to other men. One would say he had never had to do with any but women and children." my dear athos i admire you but nevertheless we were in the wrong after all how in the wrong said athos whose then is the air we breathe whose is the ocean upon which we look whose is the sand upon which we were reclining whose is the letter of your mistress do these belong to the cardinal upon my honor this man fancies the world belongs to him there you stood stammering stupefied annihilated one might have supposed the bastille appeared before you and that the gigantic medusa had converted you into stone is being in love conspiring you are in love with a woman with whom the cardinal has caused to be shut up and you wish to get her out of the hands of the cardinal that's a match you are playing with his eminence this letter is your game Why should you expose your game to your adversary? That is never done. Let him find it out if he can. We can find out his. Well, that's all very sensible, Athos, said D'Artagnan. In that case, let there be no more question of what's past, and let Aramis resume the letter from his cousin, where the cardinal interrupted him. Aramis drew the letter from his pocket, The three friends surrounded him, and the three lackeys grouped themselves again near the wine-jar. "'You had only read a line or two, said D'Artagnan. "'Read the letter again from the commencement.' "'Willingly,' said Aramis. "'My dear cousin, I think I shall make up my mind to set out for Bethune, where my sister has placed our little servant in the convent of the Carmelites. This poor child is quite resigned.' as she knows she cannot live elsewhere without the salvation of her soul being in danger. Nevertheless, if the affairs of our family are arranged, as we hope they will be, I believe she will run the risk of being damned, and will return to those she regrets, particularly as she knows they are always thinking of her. Meanwhile, she is not very wretched. What she most desires is a letter from her intended, I know that such viands pass with difficulty through convent gratings, but after all, as I have given you proofs, my dear cousin, I am not unskilled in such affairs, and I will take charge of the commission. My sister thanks you for your good and eternal remembrance. She has experienced much anxiety, but she is now at length a little reassured, having sent her secretary away in order that nothing may happen unexpectedly. Adieu, my dear cousin. Tell us news of yourself as often as you can. That is to say, as often as you can with safety. I embrace you. Marie Michon. 
"'Oh, what do I not owe you, Aramis?' said D'Artagnan. "'Dear Constance, I have at length then intelligence of you. She lives. She is in safety in a convent. She is at Bethune. Uh, where is Bethune, Athos?' "'Why, upon the frontiers of Artois and of Flanders, the siege once over, we shall be able to make a tour in that direction.' and that will not be long it is to be hoped said porthos for they have this morning hanged a spy who confessed that the rochelais were reduced to the leather of their shoes supposing that after having eaten the leather they eat the soles i cannot see much that is left unless they eat one another poor fools said athos emptying a glass of excellent bordeaux wine which without having at that period the reputation it now enjoys, merited it no less. Poor fools! As if the Catholic religion was not the most advantageous and the most agreeable of all religions. All the same, resumed he after having clicked his tongue against his palate, they are brave fellows. But what the devil are you about, Aramis? continued Athos. Why are you squeezing that letter into your pocket? yes said d'artagnan athos is right it must be burned and yet if we burn it who knows whether monsieur cardinal has not a secret to interrogate ashes he must have one said athos what will you do with the letter then asked porthos come here grimaud said athos grimaud rose and obeyed as a punishment for having spoken without permission my friend you will please to eat this piece of paper then to recompense you for the service you will have rendered us you shall afterward drink this glass of wine first here is the letter eat heartily grimaud smiled and with his eyes fixed upon the glass which athos held in his hand he ground the paper well between his teeth and then swallowed it bravo monsieur grimaud said athos and now take this that's well we dispense with your saying grace grimaud silently swallowed the glass of bordeaux wine but his eyes raised toward heaven during this delicious occupation spoke a language which though mute was not the less expressive and now said athos unless monsieur cardinal should form the ingenious idea of ripping up grimaud I think we may be pretty much at our ease respecting the letter. Meantime, his eminence continued his melancholy ride, murmuring between his moustaches, These four men must positively be mine. End of chapter 51 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia Chapter fifty two of the D'Artagnan Romances, Volume One, The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas, translated by William Robson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Captivity, the first day. Let us return to Milady, whom a glance thrown upon the coast of France has made us lose sight of for an instant. We shall find her still in the despairing attitude in which we left her, plunged in an abyss of dismal reflection a dark hell at the gate of which she has almost left hope behind because for the first time she doubts for the first time she fears on two occasions her fortune has failed her on two occasions she has found herself discovered and betrayed and on these two occasions it was to one fatal genius sent doubtlessly by the lord to combat her that she was succumbed d'artagnan has conquered her her that invincible power of evil he has deceived her in her love humbled her in her pride thwarted her in her ambition and now he ruins her fortune deprives her of liberty and even threatens her life still more he has lifted the corner of her mask that shield with which she covered herself and which rendered her so strong d'artagnan has turned aside from buckingham whom she hates as she hates everyone she has loved the tempest with which richelieu threatened him in the person of the queen d'artagnan had passed himself upon her as de Bourde, for whom she had conceived one of those tiger-like fancies common to women of her character 
D'Artagnan knows that terrible secret which she has sworn no one shall know without dying. In short, at the moment in which she has just obtained from Richelieu a carte blanche, by the means of which she is about to take vengeance on her enemy, this precious paper is torn from her hands, and it is D'Artagnan who holds her prisoner and is about to send her to some filthy Botany Bay, some infamous Tyburn of the Indian Ocean. All this she owes to D'Artagnan, without doubt. From whom can come so many disgraces heaped upon her head, if not from him? He alone could have transmitted to Lord de Winter all these frightful secrets which he has discovered, one after another, by a train of fatalities. He knows her brother-in-law. He must have written to him. What hatred she distills! motionless with her burning and fixed glances in her solitary apartment how well the outbursts of passion which at times escape from the depths of her chest with her respiration accompany the sound of the surf which rises growls roars and breaks itself like an eternal and powerless despair against the rocks on which is built this dark and lofty castle how many magnificent projects of vengeance she conceives by the light of the flashes which her tempestuous passion casts over her mind against Madame Bonacieux, against Buckingham, but above all against D'Artagnan, projects lost in the distance of the future. Yes, but in order to avenge herself she must be free, and to be free a prisoner has to pierce a wall, detach bars, cut through a floor, all undertakings which a patient and strong man may accomplish, but before which the feverish irritations of a woman must give way. Besides, to do all this, time is necessary, months, years, and she has ten or twelve days, as Lord de Winter, her fraternal and terrible jailer, has told her. And yet, if she were a man, she would attempt all this, and perhaps might succeed. Why, then, did heaven make the mistake of placing that manlike soul in that frail and delicate body? The first moments of her captivity were terrible. A few convulsions of rage which she could not suppress paid her debt of feminine weakness to nature. But by degrees she overcame the outbursts of her mad passion, and nervous tremblings which agitated her frame disappeared, and she remained folded within herself like a fatigued serpent in repose. "'Go to, go to! I must have been mad to allow myself to be carried away so,' says she, gazing into the glass which reflects back to her eyes the burning glance by which she appears to interrogate herself. "'No violence! Violence is the proof of weakness!' In the first place, I have never succeeded by that means. Perhaps if I employed my strength against women, I might perchance find them weaker than myself, and consequently conquer them, but it is with men that I struggle, and I am but a woman to them. Let me fight like a woman, then. My strength is in my weakness." Then, as if to render an account to herself of the changes she could place upon her countenance, so mobile and so expressive, she made it take all expressions from that of passionate anger, which convulsed her features, to that of the most sweet, most affectionate, and most seducing smile. Then her hair assumed successively under her skillful hands all the undulations she thought might assist the charms of her face. At length she murmured, satisfied with herself come nothing is lost i am still beautiful it was then nearly eight o'clock in the evening milady perceived a bed she calculated that the repose of a few hours would not only refresh her head and her ideas but still further her complexion a better idea however came into her mind before going to bed she had heard something said about supper she had already been an hour in this apartment. They could not long delay bringing her a repast. The prisoner did not wish to lose time, and she resolved to make that very evening some attempts to ascertain the nature of the ground she had to work upon, by studying the characters of the men to whose guardianship she was committed. A light appeared under the door. 
This light announced the reappearance of her jailers. Milady, who had arisen, threw herself quickly into the armchair, her head thrown back, her beautiful hair unbound and disheveled, her bosom half bare beneath her crumpled lace, one hand on her heart, and the other hanging down. The bolts were drawn, the door groaned upon its hinges. Steps sounded in the chamber and drew near. "'Place that table there,' said a voice which the prisoner recognized as that of Felton. The order was executed. "'You will bring lights and relieve the sentinel,' continued Felton. And this double order, which the young lieutenant gave to the same individuals, proved to Milady that her servants were the same men as her guards, that is to say, soldiers. Felton's orders were, for the rest, executed with a silent rapidity that gave a good idea of the way in which he maintained discipline. At length Felton, who had not yet looked at Milady, turned toward her. Aha, said he, she is asleep. That's well. When she wakes up, she can sup. And he made some steps toward the door. But my lieutenant, said a soldier less stoical than his chief, and who had approached Milady, this woman is not asleep. What? Not asleep? said Felton. What is she doing then? She has fainted. Her face is very pale, and I have listened in vain. I do not hear her breathe. You are right, said Felton, after having looked at Milady from the spot on which he stood without moving a step toward her. Go and tell Lord de Winter that his prisoner has fainted. For this event, not having been foreseen, I don't know what to do. The soldier went out to obey the orders of his officer. Felton sat down upon an armchair, which happened to be near the door, and waited without speaking a word, without making a gesture. Milady possessed that great art, so much studied by women, of looking through her long eyelashes without appearing to open the lids. She perceived Felton, who sat with his back toward her. She continued to look at him for nearly ten minutes, and in these ten minutes the immovable guardian never turned round once. She then thought that Lord de Winter would come, and by his presence give fresh strength to her jailer. Her first trial was lost. She acted like a woman who reckons upon her resources. As a result, she raised her head, opened her eyes, and sighed deeply. At this sigh, Felton turned around. "'Ah, you are awake, madame,' said he. "'Then I have nothing more to do here. If you want anything, you can ring.' "'Oh, my God! My God! How I have suffered!' said Milady in that harmonious voice which, like that of the ancient enchantresses, charmed all whom she wished to destroy. And she assumed, upon sitting up in the armchair, a still more graceful and abandoned position than when she reclined. Felton arose. "'You will be served thus, madame, three times a day,' said he, "'in the morning at nine o'clock, in the day at one o'clock, and in the evening at eight. If that does not suit you, you can point out what other hours you prefer, and in this respect your wishes will be complied with. But am I to remain always alone in this vast and dismal chamber? asked Milady. A woman of the neighborhood has been sent for, who will be tomorrow at the castle and will return as often as you desire her presence. "'I thank you, sir,' replied the prisoner humbly. Felton made a slight bow and directed his steps toward the door. At the moment he was about to go out, Lord de Winter appeared in the corridor, followed by the soldier who had been sent to inform him of the swoon of Milady. He held a vial of salts in his hand. "'Well, what is this? What is going on here?' said he in a jeering voice on seeing the prisoner sitting up and Felton about to go out. "'Is the corpse come to life already? Felton, my lad, did you not perceive that you were taken for a novice, and that the first act was being performed of a comedy of which we shall doubtless have the pleasure of following out all the developments?' "'I thought so, my lord,' said Felton. "'But as the prisoner is a woman, after all, 
I wish to pay her the attention that every man of gentle birth owes to a woman, if not on her account, at least on my own. Milady shuddered through her whole system. These words of Felton's passed like ice through her veins. So, replied de Winter, laughing, that beautiful hair so skillfully disheveled, that white skin, and that languishing look, have not yet seduced you, you heart of stone? No, my lord, replied the impassive young man. Your lordship may be assured that it requires more than the tricks and coquetry of a woman to corrupt me. In that case, my brave lieutenant, let us leave Milady to find out something else and go to supper. But be easy. She has a fruitful imagination, and the second act of the comedy will not delay its steps after the first. At these words, Lord de Winter passed his arm through that of Felton and led him out laughing. Oh, I will be a match for you, murmured Milady between her teeth. Be assured of that, you poor spoiled monk, you poor converted soldier who has cut his uniform out of a monk's frock. By the way, resumed de Winter, stopping at the threshold of the door, you must not, milady, let this check take away your appetite. Taste that fowl and those fish. On my honor they are not poisoned. I have a very good cook, and he is not to be my heir. I have full and perfect confidence in him. Do as I do. Adieu, dear sister, till your next swoon. This was all that Milady could endure. Her hands clutched her armchair. She ground her teeth inwardly. Her eyes followed the motion of the door as it closed behind Lord de Winter and Felton. And the moment she was alone, a fresh fit of despair seized her. She cast her eyes upon the table, saw the glittering of a knife, rushed toward it and clutched it. But her disappointment was cruel. The blade was round and of flexible silver. A burst of laughter resounded from the other side of the ill-closed door, and the door reopened. Ha, 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 cried Lord de Winter. Ha, ha, don't you see, my brave Felton, don't you see what I told you? That knife was for you, my lad. She would have killed you. Observe, this is one of her peculiarities. To get rid thus, after one fashion or another, of all the people who bother her. If I had listened to you, the knife would have been pointed and of steel. Then no more, Felton. She would have cut your throat, and after that, everybody else's. See, John, see how well she knows how to handle a knife. In fact, Milady still held the harmless weapon in her clenched hand, but these last words... This supreme insult relaxed her hands, her strength, and even her will. The knife fell to the ground. "'You were right, my lord,' said Felton with a tone of profound disgust, which sounded to the very bottom of the heart of Milady. "'You were right, my lord, and I was wrong.' And both again left the room, but this time Milady lent a more attentive ear than the first, and she heard their steps die away in the distance of the corridor. "'I am lost,' murmured she. "'I am lost. I am a, in the power of men upon whom I can have no more influence than upon statues of bronze or granite. They know me by heart, and are steeled against all my weapons. It is, however, impossible that this should end as they have decreed in fact as this last reflection indicated this instinctive return to hope sentiments of weakness or fear did not dwell long in her ardent spirit milady sat down to table ate from several dishes drank a little spanish wine and felt all her resolution return before she went to bed she had pondered analyzed turned all sides, examined on all points, the words, the steps, the gestures, the signs, and even the silence of her interlocutors. And of this profound, skillful, and anxious study, the result was that Felton, everything considered, 
appeared the more vulnerable of her two persecutors. One expression above all recurred to the mind of the prisoner. "'If I had listened to you,' Lord de Winter had said to Felton. Felton, then, had spoken in her favor, since Lord de Winter had not been willing to listen to him. "'Weak or strong,' repeated Milady, "'that man has then a spark of pity in his soul. Of that spark I will make a flame that shall devour him. As to the other, he knows me, he fears me, and knows what he has to expect of me if ever I escape from his hands.' It is useless, then, to attempt anything with him. But Felton, that's another thing. He is a young, ingenious, pure man who seems virtuous. Him there are means of destroying. And Milady went to bed and fell asleep with a smile upon her lips. Anyone who had seen her sleeping might have said she was a young girl dreaming of the crown of flowers she was to wear on her brow at the next festival. End of chapter 52 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia Chapter 53 of The D'Artagnan Romances, Volume 1, The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas, translated by William Robson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Captivity, The Second Day Milady dreamed that she at length had D'Artagnan in her power, that she was present at his execution, and it was the sight of his odious blood flowing beneath the axe of the headsman which spread that charming smile upon her lips. She slept as a prisoner sleeps, rocked by his first hope. In the morning, when they entered her chamber, she was still in bed. Felton remained in the corridor. He brought with him the woman of whom he had spoken the evening before, and who had just arrived. This woman entered, and approaching Milady's bed, offered her services. Milady was habitually pale. Her complexion might therefore deceive a person who saw her for the first time. "'I am in fever,' said she. "'I have not slept a single instant during all this long night. I suffer horribly.' Are you likely to be more humane to me than others were yesterday? All I ask is permission to remain a bed. Would you like to have a physician called? said the woman. Felton listened to this dialogue without speaking a word. Milady reflected that the more people she had around her, the more she would have to work upon, and Lord de Winter would redouble his watch. Besides, the physician might declare the ailment feigned, and Milady, after having lost the first trick, was not willing to lose the second. "'Go and fetch a physician,' said she. "'What could be the good of that? These gentlemen declared yesterday that my illness was a comedy. It would be just the same today, no doubt, for since yesterday evening they have had plenty of time to send for a doctor.' then said felton who became impatient say yourself madame what treatment you wish followed uh, how can i tell my god i know that i suffer that's all give me anything you like it is of little consequence go and fetch lord de winter said felton tired of these eternal complaints oh no no cried milady no sir do not call him i conjure you i am well i want nothing do not call him she gave so much vehemence such magnetic eloquence to this exclamation that felton in spite of himself advanced some steps into the room he has come thought milady meanwhile madame if you really suffer said felton a physician shall be sent for and if you deceive us, well, it will be the worse for you. But at least we shall not have to reproach ourselves with anything. Milady made no reply, but turning her beautiful head round upon her pillow, she burst into tears and uttered heartbreaking sobs. Felton surveyed her for an instant with his usual impassiveness. Then, seeing that the crisis threatened to be prolonged, he went out. 
The woman followed him, and Lord de Winter did not appear. "'I fancy I begin to see my way,' murmured Milady with a savage joy, burying herself under the clothes to conceal from anybody who might be watching her this burst of inward satisfaction. Two hours passed away. "'Now it is time that the malady should be over,' said she. "'Let me rise and obtain some success this very day. I have but ten days, and this evening two of them will be gone.' In the morning, when they entered Milady's chamber, they had brought her breakfast. Now, she thought, they could not long delay coming to clear the table, and that Felton would then reappear. Milady was not deceived. Felton reappeared, and without observing whether Milady had or had not touched her repast, made a sign that the table should be carried out of the room, it having been brought in ready spread. Felton remained behind. He held a book in his hand. Milady, reclining in an armchair near the chimney, beautiful, pale, and resigned, looked like a holy virgin awaiting martyrdom. Felton approached her and said, "'Lord de Winter, who is a Catholic, like yourself, madame, thinking that the deprivation of the rites and ceremonies of your church might be painful to you, has consented that you should read every day the ordinary of your mass, and here is the book which contains the ritual.' At the manner in which Felton laid the book upon the little table near which Milady was sitting, at the tone in which he pronounced the two words, Your Mass, at the disdainful smile with which he then accompanied them, Milady raised her head and looked more attentively at the officer. By that plain arrangement of the hair, by that costume of extreme simplicity, by the brow polished like marble and as hard and impenetrable, she recognized one of those gloomy Puritans she had so often met, not only in the court of King James, but in that of the King of France, where, in spite of the remembrance of the St. Bartholomew, they sometimes came to seek refuge. She then had one of those sudden inspirations which only people of genius receive in great crises, in supreme moments which are to decide their fortunes or their lives. Those two words, your mass, and a simple glance cast upon Felton revealed to her all the importance of the reply she was about to make, but with that rapidity of intelligence which was peculiar to her, this reply, ready arranged, presented itself to her lips. "'I,' said she, with an accent of disdain in unison with that which she had remarked in the voice of the young officer, "'I, sir, my mass?' Lord de Winter, the corrupted Catholic, knows very well that I am not of his religion, and this is a snare he wishes to lay for me. And of what religion are you then, madame? asked Felton, with an astonishment which in spite of the empire he held over himself he could not entirely conceal. I will tell it, cried Milady with a feigned exultation, on the day when I shall have suffered sufficiently for my faith. The look of Felton revealed to Milady the full extent of the space she had opened for herself by this single word. The young officer, however, remained mute and motionless. His look alone had spoken. I am in the hands of my enemies, continued she with that tone of enthusiasm which she knew was familiar to the Puritans. Well, let my God save me, or let me perish for my God. That is my reply I beg you to make to Lord de Winter. And as to this book, added she, pointing to the manual with her finger, but without touching it, as if she must be contaminated by it, you may carry it back and make use of it yourself, for doubtless you are doubly the accomplice of Lord de Winter, the accomplice in his persecutions, the accomplice in his heresies. Felton made no reply, took the book with the same appearance of repugnance which he had before manifested, and retired pensively. Lord de Winter came toward five o'clock in the evening. Milady had had time during the whole day to trace her plan of conduct. She received him like a woman who had already recovered all her advantages. Is a peers said the baron, seating himself in the armchair opposite that occupied by Milady, 
and stretching out his legs carelessly upon the hearth. "'It appears we have made a little apostasy.' "'What do you mean, sir?' "'I mean to say that since we last met you have changed your religion. You have not by chance married a Protestant for a third husband, have you?' "'Explain yourself, my lord,' replied the prisoner with majesty. "'For though I hear your words, I declare I do not understand them.' "'Then you have no religion at all. I like that best,' replied Lord de Winter, laughing. "'Certainly that is most in accord with your own principles,' replied Milady frigidly. Oh, I confess it is all the same to me. Oh, you need not avow this religious indifference, my lord. Your debaucheries and crimes would vouch for it. What? You talk of debaucheries? Madame Messalina, Lady Macbeth, either I misunderstand you or you are very shameless. You only speak thus because you are overheard coolly replied milady and you wish to interest your jailers and your hangmen against me my jailers and my hangmen hey day madam you are taking a poetical tone and the comedy of yesterday turns to the tragedy this evening as to the rest in eight days you will be where you ought to be and my task will be completed infamous task impious task cried Milady with an exaltation of a victim who provokes his judge. "'My word,' said de Winter, rising, "'I think the hussy is going mad. Come, come, calm yourself, Madame Puritan, or I'll remove you to a dungeon. It's my Spanish wine that has gotten to your head, is it not? But never mind. That sort of intoxication is not dangerous and will have no bad effects.' and Lord de Winter retired swearing, which at that period was a very knightly habit. Felton was indeed behind the door, and had not lost one word of this scene. Milady had guessed aright. "'Yes, go, go,' said she to her brother. "'The effects are drawing near, on the contrary, but you weak fool will not see them until it is too late to shun them.' Silence was re-established. Two hours passed away. Milady's supper was brought in, and she was found deeply engaged in saying her prayers aloud, prayers which she had learned of an old servant of her second husband, the most austere Puritan. She appeared to be in ecstasy, and did not pay the least attention to what was going on around her. Felton made a sign that she should not be disturbed, and when all was arranged he went out quietly with the soldiers. Milady knew she might be watched, and so she continued her prayers to the end, and it appeared to her that the soldier who was on duty at her door did not march with the same step, and seemed to listen. For the moment she wished nothing better. She arose, came to the table, ate but little, and drank only water. An hour after her table was cleared, but Milady remarked that this time Felton did not accompany the soldiers. He feared then to see her too often. She turned toward the wall to smile, for there was in this smile such an expression of triumph that this smile alone would have betrayed her. She allowed, therefore, half an hour to pass away, and as at that moment all was silence in the old castle, as nothing was heard but the eternal murmur of the waves, that immense breaking of the ocean, with her pure, harmonious, and powerful voice, she began the first couplet of the psalm, then in great favor with the Puritans. Thou leave thy servants, Lord, to see if they be strong, but soon thou dost afford thy hand to lead them on. These verses were not excellent, very far from it, but as it is well known, the Puritans did not pique themselves upon their poetry. While singing, Milady listened. The soldier on guard at her door stopped, as if he had been changed into stone. Milady was then able to judge of the effect she had produced. 
Then she continued her singing with inexpressible fervor and feeling. It appeared to her that the sound spread to a distance beneath the vaulted roofs and carried with them a magic charm to soften the hearts of her jailers. It, however, likewise appeared that the soldier on duty, a zealous Catholic, no doubt, shook off the charm, for through the door he called, "'Hold your tongue, madame! Your song is as dismal as a de profundis! And if besides—' The pleasure of being in garrison here, we must hear such things as these. No mortal can hold out. Silence, then exclaimed another stern voice, which Milady recognized as that of Felton. What are you meddling with, stupid? Did anybody order you to prevent that woman from singing? No, you were told to guard her, to fire at her if she attempted to fly. Guard her. If she flies, kill her, but don't exceed your orders. An expression of unspeakable joy lightened the countenance of Milady, but this expression was fleeting as the reflection of lightning. Without appearing to have heard the dialogue of which she had not lost a word, she began again, giving to her voice all the charm, all the power, all the seduction the demon had bestowed upon it. For all my dears, my cares, my exile and my chains, I have my youth, my prayers, and God who counts my pains. Her voice of immense power and sublime expression gave to the rude, unpolished poetry of these psalms a magic and an effect which the most exalted Puritans rarely found in the songs of their brethren, and which they were forced to ornament with all the resources of their imagination. Felton believed he heard the singing of the angel who consoled the three Hebrews in the furnace. Milady continued, One day our doors will ope, with God come our desire, and if betrays that hope, to death we can aspire. This verse into which the terrible enchantress threw her whole soul completed the trouble which had seized the heart of the young officer. He opened the door quickly, and Milady saw him appear, pale as usual, but with his eye inflamed and almost wild. Why do you sing thus, and with such a voice? said he. "'Your pardon, sir,' said Milady with mildness. "'I forgot that my songs are out of place in this castle. I have perhaps offended you in your creed, but it was without wishing to do so, I swear. Pardon me, then, a fault which is perhaps great, but which certainly was involuntary.' Milady was so beautiful at this moment. The religious ecstasy in which she appeared to be plunged gave such an expression to her countenance that Felton was so dazzled that he fancied he beheld the angel whom he had only just before heard. "'Yes, yes,' said he, "'you disturb, you agitate the people who live in the castle.' The poor, senseless young man was not aware of the incoherence of his words while Milady was reading with her lynx's eyes the very depths of his heart. "'I will be silent, then,' said Milady, casting down her eyes with all the sweetness she could give to her voice, with all the resignation she could impress upon her manner. "'No, no, madame,' said Felton. "'Only do not sing so loud, particularly at night.' At these words Felton, feeling that he could not long maintain his severity toward his prisoner, rushed out of the room. "'You have done right, lieutenant,' said the soldier. "'Such songs disturb the mind, and yet we become accustomed to him. Her voice is so beautiful.'" End of chapter 53 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia